This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, we're going to ask the question, what is going to happen in 2018? In other words, what can we project? What can we predict? What can we expect that will happen in America and around the world in this coming year? And this is part three of a very important series. Now, first of all, I want to say that when we gather the information, the intelligence, the research, the facts, the data, and we analyze it, then we are able to project into the future based on current trends, based on anticipated trends of what may very possibly happen in 2018. In addition to that, those of you who believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, and you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you but you're, because you put your faith in Christ and received Christ into your life and are born again, you have the spirit of truth inside you that guides you into all truth. You have the Holy Spirit inside you. And then you have the tremendous resource of the Word of God, and that's everything from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. And we are called by God to renew our minds with the Word of God. And why is that important? Because the reality is that you and I and the people we know, everybody we know, everybody we see, are literally taking a bath. We are being bathed in ideas, information, subliminal programming, propaganda, mind control, uh, persuasion, advertising, um, tr humanistic trends that all originate from not from God, but from ordinary men and women, but ordinary men and women who are fallen men and women. And yet they may have positions of power in the mainstream media or in advertising or politics or whatever. And, and they have access to media platforms such as television and radio and feature films and Broadway plays and books and uh, social media and uh, computers and the internet and just an entire spectrum of communication platforms that didn't exist 30 years ago. And yet these people, first of all, the vast majority of the people that are shaping public opinion in America and around the world, the vast majority of people who are in the business of shaping public opinion. And what does it mean to shape public opinion? It means to mold your thoughts. Shaping public opinion means they are about the business of molding your thoughts, your ideas, your beliefs, your actions, your behaviors, according to their agenda, which is not necessarily, and oftentimes, is not in your best interest. In fact, if you're educated about the subject, you would quickly understand, and I'm not talking down to the regular listeners of the Paul McGuire Report, I'm speaking to those of you who may have just recently joined us, uh, people who have been listening to our program and listening to this ministry for years, they, they already know this, but in the vast majority of situations, and this is imperative to comprehend, in the vast majority of situations, the agenda of the people who shape and mold your mind via the mass media, the internet, social media, film, television, etc., they have an agenda. They have a game plan that is actually harmful to you, your family, your children, your community, and your loved ones. And they use their media platforms for the purpose of influence. And influence is just a polite term for 
shaping your minds through propaganda, mind control, suggestion, subliminal persuasion, and so on and so forth. But you see, they have an agenda, a secret and hidden agenda. No, it's not a conspiracy theory. You know, the word conspiracy theory uh, was invented by the Central Intelligence Agency. It's a mind control word. And it was invented by the CIA and other think tanks to create uh, peer pressure and cause people not to speak about certain subjects for being fear, for fear of being rejected as a conspiracy theorist. It's a great mind control word because it allows you to s- censor people's thinking and conversation because even adults, okay, are very much vulnerable to peer pressure. In fact, Let's not kid ourselves. Adults are just as vulnerable to peer pressure as teenagers are. And we know how notoriously insecure teenagers and uh, pre-teenagers can be. Well, grown-up adults in America are equally as vulnerable. And, and the intelligence agencies and the people who specialize in propaganda, they fully understand this dynamic and they use it regularly. So they can, tr- they can control the masses by using the potential threat of being labeled a conspiracy theorist. Oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. She's a conspiracy theorist. Oh, he or she believes in conspiracy theories. And the average person in America and around the world, in Europe and Australia and New Zealand and South America and so on and so forth, deep, deep inside, the average person on planet Earth is deeply, deeply insecure about who they are and about their identity. In fact, they are more insecure today than they have been uh, in hundreds of years, if not thousands of years of mankind's history. And I'll tell you how we know for a fact that people are more insecure today than they have ever been. Before I tell you what fact proves that, I want to illustrate to you the fact that the intelligence agencies, the propagandists, the mind control experts are fully aware of this deep-seated insecurity. And they use it because they are able to control people's thinking behavior, what they write about, what they speak about, what they blog about, what they put on their Facebook, their social media, what kinds of conversations they'll bring up at work or at family gatherings or wherever. And and overwhelmingly, the larger statistical percentage of people, even if they suspect uh, something may be true, if they think people are going to reject them, and accuse them of being conspiracy theorists and believing in conspiracy theories, they're so deeply insecure that they will self-censor what they say, they will self-censor their beliefs and their actions, and they will self-censor what they talk about. And that is the the epitome, that is the ultimate goal of intelligence agencies and propaganda. You know, it's a lot of work to police people all over the world, whether you're in Russia or China. You know, they have armies of people sitting in front of computers, analyzing and studying carefully and compiling records on people's political beliefs, economic beliefs, and social beliefs, because they have to crack down with a whip or perhaps a prison sentence or a beating or a torture because for fear that they would lose control and people would begin to think for themselves. As long as they can manipulate the minds of the masses not to think for themselves, then they can count on hundreds of millions of compliant, obedient, non-question, non-questioning, subservient, slave-like people who will serve their totalitarian state with loyalty, But you see, they deeply fear the truth. 
because the truth sets you free. You have to understand that all totalitarian regimes, whether it's communist or national socialist, as in the case of Hitler, or even what are called capitalist totalitarian regimes, they all need a slave class. They all need worker bees. And the most efficient way of getting a slave class and a working class is to educate people in the mind factories we call public education, which produces a product. Every person that graduates high school or uh, gets an advanced degree, a PhD or whatever, or an area of specialty, not only do they get the degree in the particular subject matter, but they also in order to get that degree, they have to take all these courses which uh, programs them and brainwashes them into thinking and speaking and acting politically correctly. And so that's part and parcel of the educational process. So the educational process is really a mind factory. And what comes out of the mind factory are, in, 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 in a sense, real human beings, real flesh and blood human beings, but they have been programmed just like robots, just like artificially intelligent robots and cyborgs and androids. They have been programmed to think and speak and act and behave in a very particular way. And if they deviate from that programming and that input, they are labeled defective. And that's why I call the educational system mind factories. So, the way you control the masses, and this was developed, by the way, at Mystery Babylon, at the Tower of Babel, under the rule of Nimrod in ancient Babylon. Now, people always ask me this question, and really, they shouldn't be asking me the question, but I don't mind answering it. I answer it. I'm polite because I, I recognize that um, <clears throat> most people uh, have been victimized by the media and the educational system. And they have, without their even realizing it, and I try to be compassionate because my life story is different than most people's life story. By God's grace, I had a very unique childhood and very unique experiences, which allowed me to escape uh, being fully programmed. I can't say that I wasn't partially programmed. Oh, yeah, I was partially programmed. But I broke free of the programming many decades ago. And the culminating factor for me breaking free from the programming that I was receiving through media and education and a university was when I had a miraculous encounter with Jesus Christ hitchhiking on the back roads of Missouri in what only can be described as a field of dreams type experience. And there among the cornfields, it's interesting how God has a sense of humor and how God can use even your salvation story to kind of prophetically give you insight to what your future will be like. I had no, I had no understanding of the deeper meanings of, of how I got saved until many years afterwards. But you see, I was invited to a Christian denominational religious retreat about an hour outside the University of Missouri in Columbia, Missouri, with back roads and cornfields and stuff. And I arrived, I really wasn't supposed to be there. I accidentally, which means God planned it, a guy came to my dormitory to bring somebody else to this uh, Christian retreat. <laughs> and, uh, man, this is weird. I'll have to tell you part of it. It's just so weird. The dormitory has this, this endless, thin, long hallway, okay? I mean, it's a really long hallway, and it's not very wide. And uh, there's doors to the left and right. And I'm entering one end of the dormitory hallway. And way in the distance, I see this guy. I can't quite make him out. And he's sitting on the radiator. Obviously, it 
was the time of year where the radiator was not on, so he was just sitting there. And he was reading this tiny little book. That's all I can remember. And he looked up at me, and I didn't think anything of it, because I was heading towards my dorm room. <clears throat> and uh, he walked towards me, and he talked to me, and he said, uh, I'm here to meet. So uh, I don't even know if he gave me the guy's name. I don't think he did. He was respecting his privacy. He said, I'm here to meet somebody. And then he told me that he had, that he was going to take this person to a, a Christian uh, religious retreat, you know, uh, about an hour outside of the University of Missouri. Now, <clears throat> normally, I wouldn't have given that remark two seconds of thought, okay? I would have just said, you know, that's nice. I would have been polite, and I would have, like, distanced myself immediately from the guy. But when I looked into this guy's eyes, and I can still remember his name today, his name was Tim, I was caught off guard because his eyes twinkled. His eyes were bright. His eyes, I, you, know, you got to understand this. I was not a Christian, okay? Let's do the math here together. I was not a Christian, all right? I hated Christians. I thought it was a fool's religion. But I'm talking to this guy. I'm looking in his eyes, and I'm saying, there's something different about this guy. <clears throat> and what I saw in his eyes was the love of Jesus Christ beaming through his eyes. And I saw Jesus in his eyes. Now, this is pretty remarkable because I'm not a Christian. I'm in the New Age. I'm taking psychedelic drugs. I'm in the counterculture. I'm a rebel. I'm, you know, into heavy partying and, and, and uh, sex, drugs, rock and roll lifestyle, you know, highway to hell type thing. And yet... I see Jesus in this guy's eyes. So normally, so he goes to me, well, you know, uh, he asked me, would you like to come to the, to, to the retreat? Uh, yeah, and and, and, and uh, I asked him a little bit about it. And I'm telling you, 100% of the time I would have said no. But, bec but because there was something in his eyes that radiated the love of Jesus Christ and the truth of Jesus Christ and the compassion of Jesus Christ towards me, I saw Jesus in his eyes. You see, that's, that's the amazing power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. You see, when you and I walk with the Lord and are filled with the Spirit, guess what happens? We bear the fruit of the Spirit. He wasn't putting on an act. Because he was walking with Jesus, it was only natural that Jesus, that the light of Jesus, would flow from his eyes. That's what revival is all about. So I was touched, even though I didn't even know what touched really was. And so, oddly enough, I accepted his invitation. But when I got to this religious retreat uh, in the middle of nowhere with guys and girls, they all had short hair. They were, they were fraternity, sorority girls and guy types. And, you know, I had, ha I had hair down to my belt buckle and <clears throat> blue jean shirt, blue jeans, Boots, big military boots, for crying out loud. I, I can't describe these boots. Maybe some of you that were in the military would know what I'm talking about. That in terms of, I mean, I wore them because I thought they looked very cool, you know. But I, I found my father's World War II military boots in, in a closet in, in, in Queens where I grew up. And I put them on, and I said to them, and he said, like, really like rebellious looking boots so i would wear these boots that were like unique so i showed up i smoked two packs of cigarettes a day had hair down to my waist and i came to this religious retreat and all these guys looked you know short haircuts and stuff and they were sorority and fraternity type guys and girls nothing wrong with that but i expected to hear discussions about jesus christ discussions about the bible I expected, I came there looking for answers about who Jesus Christ was, you see. And when I got there, <clears throat> first of all, I found myself <clears throat> socially rejected because of my appearance. No big deal. I was used to that. I mean, I was from New York City. This was the Midwest. There were a lot of hippies on the campus of the University of Missouri. But being rejected because you have long hair and, you know, you don't fit in with the cultural model. I mean, you know, I could care less. I just like, didn't bother me. 
but I did expect to be able to engage these people in conversation. So I remember as we, the guys were bunking with guys and the girls were bunking with the girls. <clears throat> and uh, since they weren't really starting a conversation with me, I started a conversation with them. Just, you know, trying to break the ice socially and then, you know, float subtle questions, you know, about God and Jesus. Just just subtle little questions that would, would have taken a one sentence answer. But, but but all my questions, like, flatlined with them. And they had no interest in talking about Jesus or the Lord or the Bible. I said, this is odd. This is a Christian religious retreat. And then as the night went on, I realized none of these guys or girls talked about Jesus at all. I mean, they had the obligatory prayer. But that was it. There was no discussion time. And they were playing music, you know, pop music. They weren't drinking out in the open, as far as I know. But basically what it was, it was a mixture, for the, a mixer for the Christian guys to, to meet the, the Christian girls and date and develop a relationship and make out or whatever, okay? But, but, but then, you know, that's, what, that's all it was. And I'm sitting here, you got to remember, I'm a hardcore rock and roller Sex, drugs, rock and roll, revolution, you know, the whole, and I'm serious, from New York City, okay? And I'm sitting in this room, and they are actually playing a game that you probably know about called Spin the Bottle. And, you know, I forgot exactly how Spin the Bottle goes, but but I guess however the bottle spins, you go off and make out with the girl or guy of your choice or something. That's all I remember, because there was a lot of making out in the corners between the guys and the girls. And that was basically the main focus of the evening. The guys making out with the girls and laughing stuff. Now, you know, I don't have a problem with people socializing, guys wanting to meet girls and stuff. I wasn't particularly offended by the spin the bottle thing. I mean, I thought it was stupid, bordering on retarded. Because, like, you know, I'm from New York. Who plays spin the bottle? That's like something, you know, you, you would do in third grade to, 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 to get to know a girl in third grade. Spin the bottle? I mean, it was like, I felt like it was like uh, in Leave it to Beaver. You know, the time of Leave it to Beaver. So I thought this was, like, pathetic. And I said to myself, you know, I came all the way out here finding out about Jesus. If I wanted to mix it up with the ladies and vice versa, okay, I wouldn't be playing spin the bottle and making out in the corner with somebody. I would be at some hardcore party with sex, drugs, rock and roll, booze, and we would get it on. And that's all I need to say about that. You can read between the lines, okay? So I said, you know, this is like, this is like a joke. I came here to find Jesus, and these people are playing spin the bottle. I'm not interested in spinning the bottle. If I'm going to, like, sin, I mean, I'm, I didn't believe in sin, of course, but I'm going to, like, seriously party down, okay? So anyway, I told the guy who invited me, uh, that was polite, but I said, look, um, this really was not what, what I'm expecting. I'm going to hitchhike back to the campus of the University of Missouri in Columbia in the morning. He was very disappointed, but I think he understood because he saw what was going on. He was different than all the others, by the way. So he walks me to the edge of the road. And then, of course, I had that field of dreams experience, which I've shared with you. And if you haven't heard it before, you can hear it on the archives of the Paul McGuire report called Paul McGuire's Testimony. And you can get that for free or send it to people at paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. And that tells a miraculous and supernatural story of what happened the moment I left that retreat in the field of dreams experience. And I'm not going to repeat the entire testimony except to tell you that through a series of very profound miracles as I was hitchhiking on the back roads of Missouri to get back to the campus, I unexpectedly got saved. Uh because of powerful miracles that happen. And they really are powerful miracles, and I'd like to share it with you, but 
I've already done it in, in, in the, the archive program you can get for free and send it to anybody you want called Paul McGuire's Testimony. So the point is, I was looking for answers, but nobody was there to communicate the truth with me except for this one guy. Now, God overruled uh, what was happening on the earthly level, and he had assigned that day for me to get saved miraculously, of which I am eternally grateful because I was notorious at the campus of the University of Missouri because I was from New York and uh, I was known for throwing the wildest parties on campus. I was in the counterculture, I was organizing demonstrations and my dual major uh, one was filmmaking at the uh, film school, and the other was a brand new field in psychology called Altered States of Consciousness, where we studied scientifically the teachings of the, gu the gurus and psychedelic drugs and so on and so forth. And, you know, I am going to say this. <laughs> Unfortunately, in, in the world of the internet and social media, we have people that are called trolls, okay? They follow people like me in ministries like mine. And they just don't, they won't come out and say what they really believe. <clears throat> and they're receiving hidden financing from uh, liberal activist groups. And so this one particular individual on their website uh, composed a number of lies about me, just outright total lies that if you spent th five minutes researching me, you would find out the truth and you would realize it was a total lie. But they don't care, see, because they're betting on most people won't check it out. And uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the things that they lied about, among others, uh, maybe it was one was a Christian one, uh, a Christian one where the girl should know better because the people that she models her ministry after, authors and Christian thinkers, are, are personal friends of mine. Now, some have gone on to be with the Lord, but they're personal friends of mine, and they would have vouched for me, but she didn't care. And so she, she, she's, she's lied. She doesn't care about the truth. I don't, I don't even bother talking to her because she doesn't care about the truth. And the other person... So I would call her a deceived Christian. I'm not saying she's not born again. But the other person is definitely not a Christian, operates through some kind of front group that targets Christian ministers, speakers, and writers. And she accused me of lying about my major. Um, the fact that I majored in uh, altered states of consciousness and uh, filmmaking at the University of Missouri. She, she accused me of lying about that and making it up. Well, that's very amusing to me for a number of reasons. Number one is I really did major in altered states of consciousness. And the proof of it is not what this person is accusing me of. The proof of it is I have transcripts with the courses and the grades I received. And all of my grades were either A, A minus, or A plus. Most of them were A plus. And so I have <laughs> impeccable proof and documentation. That's, that's what I studied and majored in at the University of Missouri. In fact, I had to go out of my way to uh, get a hold of, of those documents, proving that I took those courses, uh, proving that I had grades, because when I was uh, uh, applying for uh, a theological seminary to get my master's in divinity, I had to supply the transcripts with my grades and courses from the university and the college I attended. And I paid, I don't know, some small fee, like $25, and they mailed me my transcripts, which proved that I took altered states of consciousness. So there's really nothing to debate about. This individual is lying. They don't care. 
whether I have transcripts or not. And their whole argument was, oh, we had one of our people call the University of Missouri to find out if, you know, there was a course called Altered States of Consciousness and did Paul McGuire talk about it. So, so picture this. This is what they consider ethical research about me. So they call the University of Missouri. Obviously, they speak to some student who's volunteering. Okay, a student who probably will be at the campus of the University of Missouri, most likely four years, maybe six years at most, but most likely four years. And then it's another crop of students. And you have to remember this person is calling to get my transcripts, which, first of all, she's not an academic. She's not with a university or whatever. So they're not, they're going to be reluctant to give out my private uh, uh, scholastic records to, to somebody who's nobody. But the, but, but the bigger point is they're talking to some part-time volunteer and I took those classes. Okay. Uh, in 1975 and 1976, no, 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 1975, yeah, I, 1974 and 1975, something like that, within a year of that, at, at most, okay? So this was like a long, long, this was decades and decades ago, and back then they didn't have computers. They had file cabinets and paper. And as you know, most universities and colleges have tried to convert everything into computers. So they're not going to be able to just look up with the snap of your fingers to check on a course in a student, uh, which happened like um, 50 years ago, for crying out loud. So of course the girl said, well, we don't have any record of the course, because they're talking to a part-time student who's looking on a computer and these records go back so far, you know, like, like between 40 to 50 years ago, and they're in paper files. So to, so to go on their blog site and, and say to the world that I'm a liar and I made it up is just, you know, it's so sleazy, it's so unethical. And, and the Christian person, see, I don't, I don't know name names. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not into a vindictive fight with people. Oh, but she certainly mentioned my name. And uh, that's what I mean. When you're in the front lines, you get a spiritual attack all the time because their attempt is to discredit you and to destroy you and your ministry, which never happens, by the way. Uh, the point being, I have records of my transcripts because I couldn't gain entrance into the uh, uh, seminary to get my master's in divinity without supplying the records. And you all know that. If you've gone from one college or one seminary or one university to another, you have to supply your college transcripts. No transcripts, you don't get in. So it's not even a debate. It's the difference between somebody who has a hidden motive and not truthful and a liar. And there's no debate because I have documented evidence of what I claim. Um, the grades, the courses, the notes, etc., etc., because it really happened. So I'm saying all that to say that when you're on the front lines, and I have written so many books based on those experiences. On top of that, I've written endless amounts of books and articles. I've done television appearances on literally countless television networks. And this is not an exaggeration, even in the slightest. I have given my testimony where I talk about attending the University of Missouri, majoring in altered states of consciousness and what happened, and filmmaking. I have written that down in books, in many, many articles. I'm talking about articles that, that have a print run in magazines of 100,000, 500,000 people. And if you combine just the Christian media, which tells my testimony, which includes my majoring in altered states of consciousness and filmmaking, this isn't an, ex an exaggeration. This is a very, uh, uh, a very accurate 
approximation. That story of my testimony and majoring in altered states of consciousness and that whole thing, which I wrote extensively about in my first book, by the way, in my second book, and I reference it in all my books. And this goes back 30 years. So you have recorded testimonies of me talking about it over a lifespan. And I would say conservatively, that message, my testimony of majoring in altered states of consciousness, how God delivered me from the New Age and the occult and atheism, and saved me, has been heard on radio, watched on television, read in magazines, to a minimum of 68 million people. And that's very conservative, not counting the reruns, because the dramatic intensity of the story and the amount of people who get saved every time I share it uh, has caught on with many uh, Christians in media and ministries who publish magazines, who, uh, who uh, do television shows, et cetera, et cetera. Up to this day, I still share this testimony. So 68 million people conservatively, I'd say it's closer to double or triple that, have heard that all around the world because many of these publications broadcast, uh, uh, print in, in, in numerous languages and these TV shows are seen all around the world. So I wouldn't be talking about something that was fictional. And believe me, they have heard what I had to say at the University of Missouri. But I guarantee you they have heard it and it has gone through the hallways and the professors of the University of Missouri. They have heard about it because people have emailed me and told me. So that's a slight digression. But you see, whenever you make an attempt... To, to effectively preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you purpose in your heart to, to uh, uh, evangelize and win souls to Christ, and one of the most powerful ways you can do that as an individual, whether your testimony is dramatic and miraculous like mine is, or whether it's just an ordinary testimony, God uses ordinary testimonies just as much as he uses uh, extraordinary testimonies, because different types of testimonies reach different types of people. And so the result of me being willing to share my testimony and the New Age and altered states of consciousness stuff has resulted in, you know, it, it is impossible to count the number of people who have recommitted their lives to Jesus Christ after they've heard my testimony. Um, or people that have become born again and prayed the sinner's prayer. You have to understand, you name the television show, I've been on it, where the host will actually give an invitation for people to come to Christ, or he'll turn the mic over to me, and I'll give an invitation for people to come to Christ. And we're talking about the largest Christian television networks, the largest Christian television shows, you know, that have audiences of like 65 million potential People, people like Sid Roth, people like God TV and Wendy Alec of God TV. She's exposed my testimony all over the world countless times. Uh, Pat Robertson, many times in the 700 Club. I mean, I can't even remember. Tom Horn, Skywatch, all the conferences that I speak at that are aired on Christian TV. And I'm having a mental block of. Uh, block because I can name program after program. Jewish voice. I mean, the list is endless. So whenever you step forward to share, and you have to take a risk, by the way, to do this. I was telling this to somebody that's very close to me. I said, when I began my ministry, you could do this kind of thing. And you could reach millions and millions of people. <clears throat> but you could always, if you had to, if things didn't work out, you could retreat from the ministry. Kind of that kind of sticks in my mouth for some reason, and and go back and get a, a regular job. But when I first started sharing my testimony to millions and millions of people, and in foreign nations too, um, even though it was in the media, you could still leave it and find uh, uh, privacy. But once 
you know, when, when the internet first began and my testimony began to p- appear, it, my testimony went viral on the internet because of all the hundreds of articles and the 31 books I've written and the YouTubes and the interviews that are endless. I mean, you have something like 44 million, 144 million hits, visits, watches, reads to stuff that leads to my testimony. Now, but this is over a span of, no, um, 25 years. But now, when you do it now, you see there's no retreat. For example, when I was first doing this, I could have always left the ministry and gone back into the business world. But 25 years ago, when the internet began, you create an internet personality, an internet profile through social media, through Facebook, through the endless Google sites, the endless blog sites that that give your testimony, the constant YouTubes, the radio programs on the internet, the television interviews on the internet. You know, I'm on Wikipedia and I'm all over the place. I'm on the hit list of the the enemies of Christianity in, in, in America from... Uh, very aggressive, uh, billionaire-financed, radical leftist groups. I mean, they hate people like me giving my testimony. So when you do that, you climb out on the branch of a tree, and there is no going back, because if I was to go out and try to get a regular job, and I'm not knocking having regular jobs, I supported my ministry. The majority of my life, this ministry was supported and is still supported by me. Um, Because for most of the ministry, I worked a full-time job in a variety of businesses and industries, and I financed the ministry. So once your public identity, you become a public person. And so if I was to go get a job and try to leave for the private business world, a prospective employer during the interview, which they routinely do, they'll look up you on the uh, internet, check out Facebook and other things, and see what they can find out about you as a person before they want to hire you. Well, there's nothing embarrassing about me out there, but it's obvious I'm a born-again Christian. I share miraculous testimonies. I give my opinion regarding economics and politics and the New World Order, and Bible prophecy, and all kinds of stuff. And that brands you. And there's a lot of businesses, especially the better paying positions, that are not going to be in a hurry to hire somebody who is so clearly a public figure. Not to mention all the Fox and CNN news I did in the History Channel specials on Bible prophecy that were the highest rated programs in in the history of the History Network, I mean, it brands you. So what am I trying to say? you got to count the cost when you go into ministry. And I made the decision 25 years ago when the Internet first began that it was, I was going to literally, I mean, I did it with intelligence. I didn't do it recklessly. I, I, I counted the cost. The Bible teaches us to count the cost before we do something. The Bible also teaches us that a a wise military general, before he engages in military warfare, he counts the cost. He evaluates whether he's going to win or lose. He maps out in his mind, does he have the resources, the military resources, the food supplies, the, the numbers of men, the armament, the weapons, the arrows or whatever, He has to map this out carefully. Does he have a geographic retreat strategy? Are there other armies that are going to come in to help him? A military general has to plan this out very carefully because if he enters into a warfare, presumptuously, he could die and all his men could die. So he has to very carefully evaluate the cost. And I did that before I climbed out on a tree where, you know, they sow the end of the branch off and you're on your own. So I I came to the place in my life where the Lord uh, substantiated, proved, um, and 
uh, affirmed my ministry as being legitimate. I knew that I had a supernatural call of God by the Holy Spirit to be in the ministry. I knew it since I was saved, but I had to mature in the Lord to understand what that meant, you see. You can have a call of God. Uh, you can have gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can know that the hand of the Lord is upon you, but you have to mature in the Lord. You have to grow in the Lord. You have to read his word and uh, fellowship and interact with uh, respected Christian leaders, iron sharpens iron, before you can take a bigger step of going full-time into ministry, where you abandon the other prospects of gener generating income. And you don't do it foolishly. You count the cost. So that's where the spiritual warfare is the greatest. But God supernaturally called me to do what I'm doing. And the important thing for you, as you're listening, you may sense God calling you to do this or God calling you to do that, whether it's full-time ministry, part-time ministry, or whatever, or, or it's business, or it's entrepreneurship, or it's starting a business, or it's working for a corporation, or it's starting a, a home-based business, whatever it is. Let me tell you something. As I said to you often, true spirituality is not like a pizza pie. God does not divide the world into different slices of pizza, where one is pepperoni and one is ham and pineapple and one is vegetarian and one is sausage. No, that's not how God divides the world. All of life is spiritual. Jesus Christ is Lord of all of life and not just the, quote, spiritual world. Evangelical Christianity is, uh, is not rightly dividing the word of God when they teach people that uh, being a pastor or an evangelist or uh, a missionary is a truly spiritual calling, and that to be a businessman or a salesman or an entrepreneur or a truck driver or the owner of your own business or a nurse or whatever is somehow a, a second-class position spiritually. I want you to understand, and I hope the, the Holy Spirit sets you free as I share this with you. God doesn't compartmentalize spirituality. Jesus Christ is Lord of all of life, and all of life is spiritual. Therefore, if God does not call you to be a pastor or a minister or an evangelist or whatever, and God calls you to be in the business world or something like that, or arts or entertainment or whatever, you must understand, or just a mother a housewife is a holy calling, and it should be respected and affirmed. And other women or men should not put you down if you've chosen to be a full-time wife and mother. Now, it's one thing if your kids are, don't have money for clothes and they're going to foreclose in your house and, and you can't pay your rent for long periods of time. I'm not talking about temporary struggle. But other Christian women and men, if a, a Christian woman who's married makes the decision that she wants to be, she's led, she's led in, in agreement with her husband to be a stay-at-home mom and to educate her children. She needs to be affirmed and respected and supported just as much as somebody who, quote, is called into full-time ministry or who works full-time. And in the same way, women who do not choose to be stay-at-home moms, but who choose to work in the business world or the corporate world or whatever, for whatever reason, they should be not looked down either as being less than spiritual because they're not at home being full-time moms. This judgment stuff has got to go. Okay? Now, so that's where you're at the front lines of the spiritual battle. And whatever... God calls you to do. If you've heard from the Lord and you know that it's God, then you're in the will of God. And if you're in the will of God, what you're doing, whatever it is, okay, if you're a maid at a, a hotel chain, and that's God's call for your life at that moment, that is just as holy and spiritual and should be just as respected as any other job.
We're not to have the world's judgment system and perception towards one another. Okay, so having said that, um, I counted the cost and I moved out. And in the corporate world, they call it branding. What, what's your brand, you know, uh, or image or, or, you know, what, what are you selling? I'm talking, I'm using business language. What are you selling? And, and what is your brand? Okay, and the idea is that your clothing, your haircut, your presentation, the way you speak, the music and everything should uh, integrate with your branding. In other words, if I'm trying to reach uh, X Hells Angels motorcycle gang members for Jesus or gang members in the inner city, whether they're Latino or African American or white gangs, you know, you would dress a certain way. Um, and, and drive a certain car. If you go in there dressed like you're going to make a corporate presentation, you're going to bomb. Nobody's going to listen to you. And by, vice versa, you don't show up at a corporate meeting dressed like a gangster. So this is wisdom in ministry. The point is, though, that in the Internet age, once you bake your cake, you're going to live with it. Now, I have no regrets because I made the decision to be a public figure identified with Jesus Christ, Bible prophecy, and subjects that some people consider to be conspiracy theories. I don't care. I counted the cost. That's what God has called me to do, and that's what I'm doing. And I'm not looking to go back and retreat. I'm in a place in my life where... I have to have courage. I have to have bold faith. Do you know why? Because I do not have a retreat strategy or an exit strategy. Not because of poor planning, but because I've positioned my life on the front lines of a spiritual battle, and my public identity is one with the Lord Jesus Christ, things like the true meaning of the Tower of Babel, and so on and so forth. And so... Um, I know there's no return. See? I either win the spiritual battle that God has put before me because I have no exit strategy. Not out of foolishness. It's just you can't become a public figure identified with stuff that is not politically correct and be branded as a Christian and expect to uh, hide from that and seek employment in the job market. It isn't going to happen. So that's simple wisdom I wanted to pass on to many of you who may be asking God for wisdom regarding this new year. You know, Lord, which way should I go? And if you take time to pray to the Lord, he will reveal to you the path he wants you to go on um, uh, incrementally. He'll speak to you through that still, small voice, that sense of inner peace. And if you're walking with the Lord and you're praying and you're renewing your mind with the Word of God, you will discover that the Holy Spirit will give you supernatural faith and boldness to do what you can't do in your flesh or your own humanness. So what we're talking about as we enter 2018 together, and you and I are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. Many of you are partners with me in this ministry. And when I use the word partners, I don't mean it in a trivial way. I consider you my partners, and I hope you consider me your partner in the Lord. And so we have covenanted together. We have made a covenant together. Not the kind of covenant that man makes with man or whatever. We have made a covenant together in the Lord, to be partners in the Lord together, to accomplish his will. That means our relationship, even though it may be primarily based on radio or TV or whatever, <clears throat> um, our partnership involves you making the choice because you've sought the Lord and you believe that the Lord has guided you to be my partner. The Lord has also guided you to be a co-laborer with me in winning souls for Jesus Christ, 
occupying the land until Jesus comes and making disciples of all nations. So when we say we're partners together in the Lord, it goes deeper than that. We are co-laborers together in the Lord. And we are laboring in the Lord's harvest of souls, uh, harvesting, planting seeds for revival and turning our nation around, and in occupying the land and making disciples of all nations. We are co-laborers. And for those of you that walk intimately with the Lord, you know what I'm talking about. Because when I speak these words to you, the reason you know that God has called you to be a partner with me and a co-laborer with me is because when I share these words with you, they, they, they don't come off like, uh, you know, uh, marbles being thrown against uh, a wall and just they bounce off and nothing happens. If you are truly a partner with me and a co-laborer with me because God has called you to do that and you've sought the Lord and then you've obeyed the Lord, guess what happens? The Lord then supernaturally grafts us together as one. There are powerful spiritual bonds that connect us. We become one body in the Lord uh, called for a task that none of us could complete individually or by ourselves. You see, we need one another. And therefore, we're partners with one another and we're co-laborers with one another as different members of the body of Christ with different gifts, callings, and talents. And those of you who have been called to be my partners and co-laborers with me, when I speak these words, they minister to your inner man or woman. You sense a spirit of peace. You sense a spirit of joy. You sp sense a spirit of oneness. You share in uh, a, a higher level of faith and joy. And those of you that have walked with the Lord, you're mature enough in Christ to know the difference between those feelings and perceptions, which are of God, and the counterfeit ones when somebody is manipulating you or using psychological trickery or hype or marketing in a counterfeit attempt to, to uh, use fleshly means to, to try to get you to be a partner or co-labor. And what happens is it doesn't feel right in your spirit. And, and it is, it is a jarring sense in the spirit. You have an uncomfortableness in, in the Holy Spirit in your inner man or woman. And what that uncomfortableness is, is the Holy Spirit is not resonating in harmony with uh, other individuals or some group or some minister or some ministry. And so if you, what happens is if you allow yourself to be seduced by the glamour, let's say, of another ministry, the power, the physical buildings, the fame, uh, the, the personality. There's nothing wrong with those things, but if the Lord has not called you to walk together and partner together, you won't have that sense of divine peace and expectation. You'll have a jarring, conflicting uh almost a sense of anxiety and you'll feel it's like trying to force your foot in a shoe that doesn't fit. That's the best way to describe it. When God calls you to partner with a minister or ministry or other Christians for a purpose, it's kind of like trying on a shoe. If the shoe is too tiny, it's going to really pinch and cramp your feet and you'll be in pain when you walk. Okay. It won't, it won't be right. Or if the shoe is too, or boot is too large, it won't be comfortable. You'll lose your balance because your foot is sliding around uh, a shoe, which is, or boot, which is larger in size, and your foot kind of gets lost in it, so you could lose your balance. When you put your foot in a shoe and it's a perfect fit and it's comfortable, there's no aggravation or sense of disorientation. So 
when we are called together, you want to know, are you called to be a partner with Paul McGuire Ministries and Paradise Mountain Church? Do you want to know if you're called to be a co-laborer with me and the other people? This is how you find out. You seek the Lord. You pray to the Lord. And you ask him, Lord, am I to be a partner with Paul McGuire and Paradise Mountain Church Ministries? And the Lord will either answer you immediately or you will be required to wait on the Lord and he will reveal it to you. And, and you may have some obstacles. You may have some questions because, you know, uh, some of the things that we do are out of the box, as Jesus did stuff that was out of the box. And you, uh, wait till, you, you wait on the Lord and he'll speak to you. And he'll say, yes, and you'll feel a peace about it. And that will come about not because Paul McGuire is manipulating you through some psychological strategy, but because he just shared uh, the vision, plain and simple, and the Holy Spirit uh, backed it up in your heart. That's how you know if you're called to be a partner and uh, or a, a co-laborer. And you know, a lot of ministries and Christian organizations, I'm not saying all, there are many, 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 many good Christian ministries and organizations that use the word partnership and co-labor properly, many of them. But there are a disturbingly large number of them who use those terms simply for the purpose of uh, uh, manipulation. Now, the other way you know you're a partner is that the message of the program, what you hear coming from my voice, it is either drawing you in, you feel that the Lord is drawing you in to listen, to send the program out. You are supernaturally led to listen. You're supernaturally drawn to the ministry that I uh, preside over under the Lord's Lordship and you are supernaturally uh, attracted to the style of delivery, and the messages feed you and build you up and, and set you on fire and grow you in Christ. There's that supernatural drawing together so that you know that it's right. And see, then I don't have to use human manipulation. I simply you know, share from my heart, and I fully and completely trust the Lord to do the rest. Now, that's a joyous thing. Because all of us are called on this earth for a variety of purposes. Including being parents and all kinds of things. And then there are those occasions where the Lord calls us to join with particular ministries and ministers. And there are many good ministers and ministries. And you listen to the Lord and you ask the Lord what you should do. And he will draw you to which ministries he wants you to connect with and become one with. It may be more than one, but you'll feel a peace by it. You, you, you will agree with the vision that's being presented and the anointing that's being poured out. So we do that as we face 2018. We have to understand that God called us before the beginning of time to be here for such a time as this. You and I have been uniquely equipped in our talents, abilities, spiritual gifts, psychological beings, where we live, our life experiences. We are uniquely equipped to be God's peaceful, law-abiding, and loving spiritual army in the last days. And that's what this ministry emphasizes because Bible prophecy is a key part of this ministry. And therefore, you and I have a unique assignment. It's different than the assignment, by the way, that most churches and most ministries have. Some have this assignment, but most don't. Most don't. They don't have, they don't have a vision for this. You and I do. And that vision is quite simply, that we take the words of Jesus Christ seriously, that we're to win souls for Jesus Christ, that we're to 
occupy the land until he comes, and that we are to make disciples of all the nations, uh, nations and uh, bring in a last day's soul harvest, and we're to turn the tide of the spiritual battle in America, because what because we understand that what happens to America is going to impact the entire world. And we share a common burden. You see, you listen to me, uh, and you uh, prayerfully and hopefully draw spiritual life from this program, because the message you hear is unique. And it's feeding you, and it's energizing you in the area of your call. And we share a common call to occupy this land until he comes. The reality is America has been abandoned largely by the Christians and the Christian leaders. The enemy, to a large degree, has overtaken our land, and he's robbed and stolen our land. And the things of God are under intense demonic attack, everything from the family to Christian morality, uh, uh, godliness, the Word of God, the Ten Commandments, uh, salvation by Christ, we're under a tense attack. And we see now, with the election of Donald Trump, and this is not a partisan statement, just how deep and pervasive the corruption, the spiritual corruption, the demonic inf infestation, uh, the evil that has taken over uh, the power centers in America, both in politics and media and culture. It's like somebody has turned over a rock and all the, you know, disgusting, crawling, slimy insects are, are going everywhere. Well, that's what Washington, D.C. is like. I have been reading and studying the news in between doing a number of things for the ministry. And uh, what I'm reading is deeply disturbing. And I'm not one who just quickly accepts everything he sees on the internet. So I haven't reached a conclusion yet. I have to check and double check and recheck to make sure the sources of information that I'm receiving this information from are indeed accurate and reliable because I can't act on false information. But I have been able to determine at the very least that there is indeed, this isn't a conspiracy theory, there is an ongoing attempt to impeach Donald Trump, to remove him from office by any means necessary. That's sobering, but that's the truth. Why? Because the globalist elite themselves have said he's the greatest threat to their globalist one world government. And he is the greatest champion of Christian freedoms to preach the gospel, Christian freedoms to have church and communicate the word of God. He's the greatest champion for standing up for Israel by actually making and recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. He's the greatest champion uh, for the oppressed and those that are the victims of sex trafficking and all kinds of horrendous crime. And he, he has exposed the corruption in our government, the financial mismanagement, which, by the way, is called stealing and corruption in the highest places. He, I was talking to a very powerful man this morning who works with the most powerful leaders in Washington, D.C., and he's a very strong Christian. And he said to me on the phone, he said, Paul, Donald Trump is teaching the body of Christ in America, and Donald Trump is teaching Christians in America how to be fearless once again, and how to be aggressive once again, and take back what the devil has stolen from us. And isn't that strange that God has to raise up a man that we don't know for sure if he's accepted Christ but he knows more about occupying the land and standing up for right and not being afraid to confront evil and to engage evil with a, a healthy aggression than most Christians do. Most Christians have allowed themselves to, to be programmed by the world into this surrender, this false passiveness, this, this uh, cowardliness, this 
feminization of males, hate to break it to you guys and some of you uh, gals out there, but um, many of you already know this, that men and women are created differently, despite the obvious physical differences God intended, despite what women's liberation says, God intended for the male to have unique psychological, physical, mental attributes that are different from the female, who she possesses unique psychological, physical, physiological attributes, and they, they're to complement one another. But you understand that the, that the hidden agenda using mind control and films and role models Oh, let me tell you something. The elite love to lift up and raise up role models that that present a lying image, a false identity image, uh, and then get women and men to follow it, to lead them away from the paths of God. And so there's been there's been an unrelentless, or is it re relentless? There's been an ongoing attack to reprogram males by raising up false role models and identity models so that the ideal male in our generation is now feminized. He is insecure. He does not know what true manhood means. He lacks courage. He lacks boldness. He lacks the confidence to be a leader. And he, in, in many ways, that, that disparaging description uh, that he's a girly man, and that, that is not meant to be a, a, a slur on people that are gay, by the way. That's meant to be a rebuke to this confused identity that especially permeates churches where men are feminized and they're girly men. They act more like girls in many ways than they do men. And, and, and that, you know, that's not just because that's, that was done on purpose. That was done through scientific mind control, indoctrination, subliminal programming, propaganda, and the systematic raising up of role models in the culture, like male movie stars, male rock and roll stars, male television stars, male sports figures, male politicians, who uh, demonstrate feminized attributes, and they are considered the ideal. And this also happens in the educational system. In the same way, while that programming has been going on, the social engineers that are funded by the globalist elite have been making women more and more masculine, more and more male-like. So women uh, have uh, strategically lost the uniqueness uh, which has made them female, which has made them feel like women. Now, don't confuse what I'm saying. I'm not talking about uh, oppressing women. I'm not talking about women getting paid less. I'm not talking about making women a second-class citizen. Not at all. God gave Adam and Eve equally rulership, the rulership and the ability to rule and reign planet Earth. That power was given to Adam and Eve equally. And if you examine a, a biblical marriage, in, 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 in the proper interpretation, nowhere in the Apostle Paul's description of a Christian marriage, unless you read it incorrectly, can you possibly come up with the false idea that the man is supposed to be like the employer and the woman is supposed to be like the employee? But let me tell you something. In many, many churches in America, and certainly the world has this image of what Christians believe, there's this subconscious belief system that is still rampant among many Christians and exists in many Christian marriages through faulty Bible teaching that the female is like a second-class citizen 
and that she is to be uh, like the employee and the male is supposed to be like the king and he's supposed to be the employer. Well, that's a perversion of uh, the biblical description of marriage. It's a distortion and it's ugly and it destroys marriages and it's a bad witness to the culture. The truth of the matter is that in uh, the book of Ephesians, when the apostle Paul talks about marriage, notice closely the verbiage that Paul uses. And I'm gonna read that to you because as you approach 2018, with the expectation that God is giving you a dream and a vision to conquer the land, your own personal land, the land that we partner together to occupy, you will not be able to do this successfully unless you understand how to rightly divide the word of God so that every area of your life is in biblical balance. And you see, if your marriage or your social relationships or parenting or things like that are out of balance because of bad Bible teaching, you're going to experience a a very high level of unnecessary stress, unnecessary temptation. And this is why so many Christian marriages end in divorce and end in uh, separation and are uh, unhappy. Because uh, subconsciously, both the man and the woman have very uh, faulty ideas of what their roles are in a Christian marriage. And let me just say one thing right into your face. A Christian marriage is not supposed to be two sets of keys to a jail cell where you lock yourself inside the jail cell and say to death, uh, until death do us part. A Christian marriage is not supposed to be a prison cell, but too often it turns into a prison cell and people, because they sincerely want to obey the Lord, will suffer and endure um, hell on earth in the prison cell. And God, you know, the blessing of God is on you because you're attempting to obey the Lord and not be divorced. But God wants to uh, miraculously transform your marriage relationship and bless it so it's not a jail cell. It should be a little piece of heaven on earth. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. I want to thank all of you, by the way, who have obeyed the voice of the Lord and are actively standing with us in intercessory prayer, engaging in spiritual prayer warfare for me, my family, in this ministry. I want to thank each and one of, one of you that have accepted the assignment of the Holy Spirit to be prayer warriors on behalf of this ministry. Thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you who have uh, sought the face of the Lord and have obeyed God when he has asked you to donate or contribute financially to this ministry so we can accomplish our goals acquire the technology we need to reach millions and millions of more people. I want to personally thank you for your obedience to the Lord. And I truly mean that. And I want to thank each and every one of you who use your creative talents to help spread our radio messages and other messages and help us bypass all the hidden censors on the internet because you take an interest in promoting this message. I want to thank you personally for that. And I pray, I want you to know that I pray over you by name as much as I can. And by that, when people write with a prayer request or people write a letter or people <clears throat> send us an envelope with a donation or a contribution or question, I try to, as best I can, to physically look at the envelope, the name, where you live, and then I immediately pray for you, immediately. Um, and it may take me, you know, I do it incrementally. And I, But I want you to know, I see your name. I pray over you. I try to pay attention to where you live. And I'm praying for you. Because the Lord put it on my heart that if I am a priest and as a minister, 
uh, in one sense or another, I am a priest to the Lord, that the Lord has given me an anointing that comes with a calling. And um, I believe that it's my responsibility to know who you are and to pray the blessing of God and to pray over you. And that's why I, I look at your name and where you're uh, communicating from. Today, I walked to, uh, uh, I was loading up a post office, uh, the gray post office boxes filled with envelopes coming from our ministry and looking at envelopes coming into our ministry. And I picked up every single one of them and read before my eyes your name and your address. And then instantaneously, I prayed. And then I instantaneously pray for the next person. And the reason I do that is because I've discovered that if I will, if I do not pray for you immediately when your name comes before me, the chances are very large that I will never pray for you. And I don't want to be guilty of, of lying. So the minute I see your name, that's when I pray for you. So I, I don't have to face the Lord and say, you promised all these people you'd pray and you forgot. The only way I can keep myself from forgetting is to pray the moment I see your name in an envelope. So I hope that encourages you. Um, we will be back in a nanosecond. You can visit paulmcguire.us. That's paulmcguire.us. Send an archive of this program or other programs. We have discounts on the books. Trumpocalypse is being used incredibly by God. Um, I'll share that in a minute. And um, the book Conquering the Matrix is setting many people free whose lives have been crushed and minimized and stomped on through various forms of social engineering, mind control, programming, and uh, somebody other than God sculpting your personality. God wants to set you free, but you have to understand what you're up against. And this will give you a very high-powered education about what you're up against. The name of the book is Conquering the Matrix. It's deliberately not titled Lost in the Matrix or simply Escaping the Matrix or whatever. It's entitled Conquering the Matrix because God has given you the power to conquer the Matrix. And that happens when you learn the power of renewing your mind. You're listening to the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us. We'll be back in a second. This is the Paul McGuire Report. I'm Paul McGuire. So keeping up on my regular research, uh, and we talk about this in great detail in the book I've written with Troy Anderson called Trumpocalypse, which, by the way, is hit number one in like 15 different categories in Amazon. And that's with almost no promotion because I, um, I decided that I decided not to promote Trumpocalypse uh, during Christmas, etc. And the reason I decided that is because um, I've been involved in a lot of books, etc. And with the book coming out January 2nd, I felt it, 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 the, the power intensity of the message would get lost <clears throat> in the uh, Christmas holidays and the Thanksgiving holidays. So normally I start promotion way, way in advance. In any case, we've just begun the initial phases of promoting the book and getting the message of the book out there. And just with the initial phases, um, we it's obvious what, what the publisher, this is a secular publisher, Hachette Publisher, Hachette Publishing, the third largest publisher in the world, by the way. They own so many other publishers, and they have a Christian division. It's the Christian division, Faith Words, that publishes uh, my books and Troy's books, like The Babylon Code and Trumpocalypse. The secular head of this massive publishing corporation that's based in France said when the title and the cover concept and the outline for the book was presented to their staff, the secular head of this corporation immediately said that Trumpocalypse would be a New York Times bestseller. Now, I pray that that will happen, and I'm asking that you pray that that will happen. Not for ego, not for money, 
and we're dealing with potential bias against by the New York Times against what's in our book. But you see, uh, the New York Times and other powerful uh, secular institutions are the gatekeepers of our society. And so when your book, or whether it's in music or film or television or whatever, hits a recognizable number or achieves sales results high enough to warrant being a New York Times bestseller, then this is essential to opening up a whole different level of doors which will reach a far larger audience in the United States and globally. In other words, when a book is called a New York Times bestseller, it is then reviewed, it's put in all kinds of bookstores, all kinds of opportunities open up to expose the message of Trumpocalypse to millions and millions of more people than who, who would ordinarily be exposed to it. So it's not out of greed or ego that we want this to happen. It's we want the favor of God. And the favor of God enables us to be platformed. Remember earlier in the programming, in the program, I talked about how uh, certain kinds of men and women in this nation uh, have media platforms, and they're using it for evil and and for the wrong motives. But they have very very powerful media platforms. Now, the reality is, is the media as in many other businesses, is a highly competitive marketplace that is rigged, if you will, in favor of secular, politically correct types of, of, of books. When we achieve New York Times bestseller status, that all of a sudden positions our book at a much higher level. In fact, it gives it a much higher platform and from that platform, we are then able to reach uh, tens or 25 million, I mean, just a massive uh, increase in the numbers of people who will be influenced by the biblical and prophetic message in Trump apocalypse. Um, <clears throat> many, many more people, many more institutions, all kinds of doors open because the primary door that you have to walk through is called the New York Times bestseller list. It's a, it's a gate that has to be opened. But I want you to understand our motive and purpose in wanting to achieve that goal. And I'm asking you to pray for us regarding that because, as you know, there are hostile spiritual and natural forces that simply don't want that. You see, if you write a book like The Da Vinci Code, which doesn't tell the truth at all about the Illuminati, it's simply... It's simply a diversion that hides the reality of the Illuminati. It's easy to soar up on the New York Times bestseller list. But if you're writing a book that contains biblical truth and the gospel of Jesus Christ, we would be very naive to think that it's going to be a piece of cake. You have to work much harder. You have to pray much more intensively because there are all kinds of powers that want to make sure that that gate is firmly shut uh, so you can't get the New York Times bestseller status. Because if you get it, it will cause the gospel to just be poured out on millions and millions of people around the world, which makes it possible for a very powerful spiritual impact, the kind of spiritual impact that can change potentially the course of a nation by God's grace and help. And I'm very serious about that. So I'm asking those of you who are prayer partners with me, who are co-laborers with me, to, to make that part of your assignment. It is spiritual warfare. I'm not here to I'm not going to sit here and tell you what's happened to me in the last two weeks. But I will say this: from the moment we made the decision to start making Trump books public. We've done a, a number of very big Christian television shows that reach a lot of people, uh, a number, a select number of big Christian radio programs, 
and some other things. Okay, now, the minute we did that, and because I'm a, a veteran of many spiritual wars, all hell broke loose upon me and my family and Troy, okay? I mean, it was supernatural because there's no way naturally all these coincidences could have happened. Now, I don't want to tell you what happened because I don't want to give the enemies of the gospel the light in knowing what happened, and I don't want to encourage them. But I will say this to you, because I have to be careful about what I say. I was attacked on, I've been attacked on a personal level, um, in, in very powerful and insidious ways. The moment I committed to the, to the spiritual mission of Trumpocalypse, therefore I'm asking for your fervent and militant spiritual intercessory prayers for me, my family, and this ministry. Uh, because we're on the front lines. The devil knows we are going to take territory, but he's going to fight us, and he has already opened up fire upon us. And when you're on the front lines, the, the weapons of the evil one are very intense. Now, am I afraid? Am I afraid? No, I'm not afraid. Do I believe we will prevail? Absolutely. Because as Joshua said to the Lord, we are well able to take the land. I and Troy are offering the Lord a good report. We are well able to take the land. And the giants perceive us as giants, and they perceive themselves as grasshoppers. So we offer a good report, despite the fact that we're in battle. Number two is other things happened that should not have happened. And I won't go into detail because uh, this is a public forum. I mean, strange, destructive things happened. And again, I know it's part of the spiritual battle because I've been through this type of thing before. And then finally, um, I don't consider this a, I mean, I don't consider this a great personal threat. In fact, the Lord turned it into a blessing. Uh, my co-author Troy, when we were on Skywatch, Tom Horn's uh, TV network, mentioned that uh, uh, our book Trumpocalypse was encouraging people uh, to to participate in a coming national day of repentance, and that we were going to use our influence with President Trump to uh, have him call for a national day of repentance, not just prayer, but repentance, repenting of our sins so that the judgment of God will not fall on our nation. When he merely mentioned that, just in a couple of sentences, and I mentioned the fact that President Trump would be receiving a copy of the book and that he would be reading it. I mean, we only talked about it for a couple of minutes. There are people, very powerful organizations in this nation that intensely dislike Christians, conservative principles, evangelical Christians, Christians that believe in Bible prophecy, somehow because they're financed by billionaires, sec secular atheistic billionaires, they, they picked up the show, they picked up the comments, and they blasted, they used their powerful, powerful media machine to blast the cover of Trumpocalypse, the video clip of our television interview, and our, our support of a National Day of Repentance and Donald Trump reading the book, they blasted it everywhere across the Internet, and it went viral. Which is good, because it helps promote the book. But it also means that, you know, the enemy is focusing on, in our efforts. I mean, for what? But why are they focusing on us? Because we dared to call for a spiritual solution because we dared to call for a national day of repentance we weren't making a political statement we weren't promoting trump and, and, and attacking a democrat all we did was call for a national day of prayer and and for that we got the the wrath of these activist groups that is just the first salvo of a long-term intense spiritual battle and I actually was very encouraged, even though, you know, this was not fun, all this stuff together, 
I was very encouraged because I said to myself, Lord, you must be planning uh, some incredible victories for us to be attacked so viciously, so quickly. Now, I understand that the only way to win this warfare is that our fight is not against flesh and blood, but it's against the principalities and the powers and the dark unseen forces of wickedness in heavenly places. We are fighting invisible spiritual forces. And so again, I ask you to pray for me, my family, and our ministry, and what we're doing. And pray for yourself. We also need finances um, to launch uh, the, the enhanced social media. We have a lot of things just ready to go. And within, within a very short period of time, we will be reaching millions of more people through television, through all kinds of things. And that, too, will take a lot of land for Jesus. We will occupy the land. And then we are very thankful because the Lord has raised up this book, Trump Apocalypse, uh, because it, it, it is a book that gives answers to Christians and non-Christians. Uh, by God's grace, it is well written, it's well documented, and its message is clear. And all the Christians who are confused about Trump and prophecy, and this will answer their questions. It will also, uh, when it's given to uh, leading Democrats and leading Republicans and the president and others, it's going to minister to them very powerfully because it speaks about a whole range of issues that are important to them. And, for example, I think I mentioned it in the beginning of the program, Dr. Ben Carson uh, received his copy of Trumpocalypse two days ago. He couldn't put it down. He devoured the book in two days, and today I heard from someone extremely close to him that he is just on fire about the message of Trumpocalypse, and that fire will spread. Uh, Vice President Pence and his wife will receive copies, and of course Trump will receive a copy, and all of these men will read it. And then the leading, not the leading, uh, uh, Large numbers of Democrats and Republicans will receive copies. And, and I can't just in a short minute or two describe to you all the contents of the book, but the book teaches about why America was raised up, the purpose of our Constitution, God's plan for America, uh, the Christian foundation of America, and what America has to do in these last days. And it's a powerful book. It has the, but again, by God's grace, it is the power to ignite a revival. And it has the power to, sometimes you need to write down a narrative, a manifesto, if you will, of ideas so that a movement can be birthed. Again, this is not for the purpose of self-aggrandizement or bragging. But you see, the humanist manifesto, there were three of them. It launched the humanist movement, but it had to be written down, had to be codified in a book. The Communist Manifesto uh, was written down in a book, and it birthed the communist revolutions. Uh, the Christian Manifesto, written by Dr. Francis Schaeffer, helped organize 30 years ago a, a movement of Christians uh, who were reclaiming America for Jesus Christ. And many books throughout history, like Thomas Paine, who wasn't even a Christian, uh, wrote a book that woke, I can't remember the title of his book, it slips my mind right now. But evangelical Christians, during the early parts of the American Revolution, were sleepy and not wanting to get involved. And Thomas Paine, who was uh, not a Christian, I think he was a Freemason and maybe a member of the Illuminati, he wrote a powerful book. I wish I could remember the title. It escapes me for the moment. But his book, where he wrote down his ideas in a book form, changed the course of the American Revolution because even though he was not a Christian, it woke up all the non-Christians in America. It woke up the Founding Fathers. And it had a very powerful effect on our Christian Founding Fathers so that they were stirred up to go into action, not just sit and pontificate and be passive. And his book 
uh, literally set them on fire. And because of that, we have a free nation today. So that's the power of certain kinds of books in certain periods of history. Again, this is not self-promotion or self-aggrandizement. I've heard the same feedback from so many high-level leaders, high-level Christian leaders. I don't want to name names to name names. High-level politicians. And, and, and quite frankly, I am humbled and surprised because they have all said, this book is the most important book uh, that needs to be out. This book has the power to change our nation. And, and, and quite frankly, I believe that. Uh, but it's one thing to believe it yourself. It's one thing to have respected leadership affirm that. And that's why the book has to get out there. If you know me, if you know Troy, my, my goal is not money. My goal is not fame. It never has been. My goal is fulfilling my assignment before uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. I have X amount of years on planet Earth. I don't want to get a bunch of earthly rewards and have it burn up as wood, hay, and stubble at the judgment seat of Christ. I am acutely aware of that. I want you to know that. I tremble. I literally tremble. And not for fear of losing my salvation, because I'm saved by grace. I can't lose my salvation. But I literally tremble with a holy fear, because I know I'm going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, where Christ is going to hold me accountable for everything I did on earth, with my abilities, gifts, talents, my life, and everything that I did for ego or self or something like that will burn up. It will be consumed like wood, hay, and stubble. It will not go with me into eternity. And if your life is filled with, with stuff you did for your ego, self, or whatever, Jesus compares that accountability process like a holy consuming fire which burns up all the wood, hay, and stubble in your life, but you will escape like a man or woman who escaped from a burning house and you'll still go to heaven. But I don't want to, I don't want, I, I'm very sober about this. I think about this all the time. I don't want that to be my fate. I know I'm going to stand before Jesus Christ. He can see right through me. And, and I, I, I want to do those things which please him and that will carry with me in eternity. And that means a purity of motive, a purity of intent, so that when I tell you that the purpose of Trump apocalypse is to ignite revival, to save souls, to change the course of a nation, I can say it with a clear conscience, because that is the purpose of my heart. And I believe the Lord will honor that, and I believe that that will not be consumed as wood, hay, and stubble. And I'm not interested in a crown and those rewards. The reward that will satisfy me is to know that the Lord used our efforts collectively as partners to win souls to Jesus Christ and to spare many lives from captivity and destruction. That's what's in my heart, folks. If you could see into my heart, that's what's there. And it's not there because I'm such a pure, righteous, and holy guy. You know why it's there? It, didn't, it wasn't there 20 years ago. It wasn't there 30 years ago. It wasn't there when I started out. I was in media. I was writing books. But there was a lot of ego in me, a lot of self in me, a lot of mixed desires for fame as well as ministry. Okay? That's how I started out. And God brings you through a process of trials and tribulations, which are painful. But in the process of going through the trials and tribulations, especially when you're called into a ministry like this, the holy fires of God's holiness through trials and tribulations burn away the impurities, the wood, hay, and stubble. The heat of adversity burns away the the, the, the falsehoods, the self-deception. And it's a very painful process, and it takes years, but I don't regret it for a moment. So now, decades later, at a different season of my life, I can look in the mirror and honestly say, without lying, that my purpose is true. That's what I'm all about. And 
the, the, the roaring passion that I have in my soul. It is a roaring passion. I mean, if I could describe it, it would be like the power of Niagara Falls pouring out of my heart, except the Niagara Falls would be the rivers of living water. Again, this is nothing to do with some inherent goodness or virtue on my part. It's simply God's grace working through my life. But I have a passion like Niagara Falls. My heart breaks. I am gripped with a burden when I look upon my nation. And I see so clearly what was, is going to happen to America. I can see it so clearly um, that America will become a totalitarian state of horrific brutality, persecution of Christians. It will be a wasteland. It will be a nightmare. I'm not saying that to scare you. I'm saying it because I can see it very clearly. But the Lord gave me a vision July 4th, 2012, and he reinstilled that message in a Paradise Mountain Church meeting when we were praying for the President of the United States of America. And with all my heart, I believe Trump represents a reprieve, an open door. And God has placed before his church an open door. This is the final last chance. If we fall asleep, if we ignore the Lord, uh, that's it. That's it. This is the time. This is the time to throw everything you have into the battle. And we can together, if we listen to the Lord and we seek the face of the Lord and call on his name, we can for... <clears throat> a temporal period of time, turn the tide of the spiritual battle. Restrain the forces of darkness is what Jesus wants. Because you see, like it or not, American exceptionalism is biblical. Pilgrims and Puritans entered into a covenant with God that caused America to be a very exceptional nation. I write about this in A Prophecy of the Future of America and uh, Mass Awakening. And America is the only nation on planet Earth right now, with all of its faults, which has the economic and legal capacity to be a launching pad for a, a, a last day's soul harvest, a light to the world. And that's because we still have a constitution that has some integrity to it, such as freedom of religion and freedom of speech and, and freedom of the press. But let me tell you something, all hell Every demonic power is waging war against this as most of the church sleeps. Censorship on the internet is growing daily. It's surging. Talk about a surge in military terms. Under, under the lies like net neutrality, the high-tech giants with their billions of dollars are selling us down the river and they are using technology to censor our message to censor the preaching of the gospel. They're shutting it down right in front of the eyes of God's people. And how are they able to shut it down right in front of the eyes of God's people? Because God's people are asleep. They're drunk. I'm not being unkind. This is coming from the Niagara Falls of passion that's locked up within my soul. The people of God, for the most part, with few exceptions in America, don't even understand that this is the final battle for America. They don't understand that we are on the precipice of losing our freedoms and losing our democracy and flipping into some kind of Marxist totalitarian state, a super surveillance state, a police state, where one crisis or one manufactured crisis away from that happening. That's reality. That's not paranoia. But most of the people of God, most of the church cannot see the obvious. It's like a neon sign before them, but they're drunk. They're in a stupor. They can't see it. They're under a great delusion. And there are evil forces conspiring, breaking laws, selling the bodies of little children in secret pedophilia rings, 
connected with Satanism in the highest levels of government and power in America and throughout the world that are involved in the cover-up and the censorship that also involves the deep state that's been co-opted. Let me say this to you. This is not a game. This is the final moment where God is giving us one last window of opportunity. If we obey the Lord, if we move in faith, if we renew our minds, if we repent individually and as a nation, we can, please hear me, we can turn the tide of the spiritual battle in your own personal life and nationally. But in order to turn the tide of the spiritual battle, we must overcome the forces of darkness. Now, overcome means overcome. It doesn't mean surrender. Some Christians have had their brains turned upside down somewhere along the way. You don't defeat an enemy by lying down in front of the enemy. You overcome the enemy through the wisdom of God and reliance on God and the strategies of God. We have a powerful spiritual enemy that's attempting to devour the America because America, again, however imperfectly, is the last light on planet Earth. God wants us to occupy until he comes. It's a temporal time period because God is love. Because God is love, he wants as many people in heaven with him as possible. That means before the Lord Jesus Christ returns, we are commanded, not requested, we are commanded by God to occupy until he comes so that we can win souls and preach the gospel. See how it all fits together? It is God's desire for us, his people, to win hundreds of millions of souls to Christ in a last day souls harvest before the Lord returns. That's why we have to occupy until he comes so that we can be free to preach the gospel and bring in millions of souls to the kingdom. Why? Because God is love and he wants as many people as possible to be with him, to be his children for all eternity in heaven. That's why God said, be fruitful and multiply. God is love. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So our marching orders are clear. If you love God as you say you do, the love of God should be shed abroad in your heart. You should be driven. The Niagara Falls of the living water should be pouring out of your inmost being. And you should be able to, without one second of hesitation, Go to the mat and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. And the moment you decide to do that, let me promise you something. You want to see a sign, a wonder, and a miracle as you enter 2018? Let me promise you something. In any way you can, between now and before the new year begins, you bow before the Lord. You invite Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. You ask God. You surrender your life, your talents, and abilities to God, and you ask him to use you. You ask him to fill you with the divine compassion, the bursting forth of the Niagara Falls of the living waters, and you surrender to the Lord, and you ask God to set you on fire so that you can be equipped to be part of his spiritual body to occupy the land and turn the spiritual battle around. If you do that and you mean business, this is what will happen. God will send his power on you, his wisdom on you, his anointing on you like you've never experienced it in your entire life. It may happen instantaneously. It may be emotional or it may be subtle and incremental. It doesn't matter how it plays out. The point is, it will play out. The moment you surrender and mean business with the Lord, he'll covenant with you on a deep level, and you will receive an anointing from the Holy Spirit. You will receive gifting that he has held back because he couldn't trust you. You'll receive gifting. He'll watch your back. He'll defend you in spiritual battles. He'll provide for you supernaturally. To the degree that you sell 
out totally to the Lord. You will see bondage lifted from your life. You will see the grace of God poured out of your life. You will see such a dynamic reversal in your own personal fate while you're down on, here on earth that your ears will ring with what is happening before you. And that dynamic transformation that is unleashed through your surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit will echo chamber to your loved ones, your spouse, whether you're single, people you work with, people in church, friends, neighbors. You will be a broadcast tower of the Holy Spirit. You ain't seen nothing yet. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power of power. The reason the Christian church is weak in America is because it's worshiping itself. It's worshiping man. It's worshiping man-made doctrines. That is idolatry. We need to repent of worshiping ourselves and worship the true God. What is happening in the throne room of God right now as we're talking together? There are millions of people in the throne room, angels, uh, resurrected people. And, and there's a giant chorus in the throne room of God, which is, which is beautiful beyond description with translucent emerald-like floors and all these angelic beings. And they're saying over and over again, as the glory of God fills the throne room of God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Wow. Wow. It's under that anointing that you move forward. And he will not fail you. And he will make you an overcomer beyond anything you will con that you can conceive of or think of. So simply surrender to the Lord and exercise your mustard seed of faith. Send this program out to people who need it. Visit paulmcguire.us. And this is something that we do together as partners and as people who are joined together in a call from the Lord, I ask you to join me in the most powerful intercession you've ever engaged in in your life. Pray with groanings of intercession. Let the anointing of God infuse your intercession. Pray for me, my family, and this ministry. I gave you reasons why. Seek the face of the Lord while he's there and ask him what you can do to contribute uh, or donate to this ministry and obey whatever the Lord says. Because remember this principle, as you seek the Lord for guidance and wisdom to do his work, his business, then when your time of need comes, God will be familiar with you as you seek the Lord again on your own behalf. And those channels of resources and wisdom and grace and blessing will be open to you. God's speed. God's speed. We are well able to take the land. And together we shall. Nothing is impossible with God. It doesn't matter what the mainstream media says. Nothing is impossible with God. You and I will live to see an igniting of a biblical revival and the igniting of a biblical third great awakening that will rock this nation and shake this nation. You and I will live to see this spiritual battle turned around and the armies of hell will be pulverized and crushed. Nothing less than victory. Enough of this myopic and cringing stuff before God. He's given you the keys of the kingdom. We need to use it and take the land because souls the lives of precious children and women by the hundreds of millions on planet Earth. They're dying without knowing Jesus. And if we don't give them Jesus, they won't be in heaven. So let's do it. Like that Nike commercial, you know, just do it. God bless you. I love you. I thank you for everything you've done. You have no idea how deeply I appreciate you, your letters, your encouragement, your emails. I read them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now together, let's worship the Lord by, take the, by taking the land. God bless you, I'm Paul McGuire. This is how we break down the gates of hell as we plunge into 2018. Amen and amen. <laughs>